Good morning, Saturday, August 22nd, 2020, Pastor Ron Jetter, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Grandview, Washington, on an even cooler day. It's supposed to be down in the high 40s tonight. It barely got into the 60s a week ago. Wow, and now it's going to get down into the 40s. A hint that gradually the earth continues to turn, the seasons continue to change, the harvest will begin in the days to come. The corn, the hops, the apples, the grapes, all these things finally coming to a culmination. But that's not what today's topic is about. If I, in fact, I had to, had to think of a, uh, a title for today's talk, I could say, do you believe in love at first sight? Or I could say, what comes around goes around. Because there's a little of both. As we heard yesterday, Jacob went to his uncle and as he was traveling there, came across a well where flocks were being watered and met his cousin Rachel, who was lovely and beautiful and graceful and everything a, a man could want in a cousin that he's going to marry. And he says to his uncle, wow, I will work for you. My only wages will be room and board and the right to marry Rachel. And Laban says seven years. And that's the term of an indentured servant, really. At, at seven years, you could then have your freedom and a portion uh, of whatever the the uh, owner would give you. You'd make that agreement ahead of time. So Laban has agreed with Jacob. You work for me seven years and you will marry Rachel. And it said, as we heard in that last verse, oh, it was but a few days it seemed to him because of his love for her. The first time they met, they kissed as cousins. And I'm guessing that after that, they didn't kiss as cousins anymore. Wow. Those of you who uh, have been in love relationships or are still in one, do you remember back how it began, how the romance was? Uh, is the romance still there? Well, we have a wedding a week from today, and that's a day to celebrate romance, although weddings are also, frankly, stressful. Uh, I've done a hundred and some odd weddings, a hundred and some odd funerals, and boy, I tell you, at a funeral, the guest of honor never complains, never raises a ruckus, is never late. That's, uh, I hate to be crass that way, but funerals, people are grieving, they want to hear hope, they want the story of their lost loved one honored. And that's frankly a lot easier to do than to put up with all the competing egos and interests and the hopes and the fact that the slightest little thing all of a sudden gets blown out of proportion by people whose fuss budget is already in deficit spending. I'm not saying that my daughter is going to be that way. I'm not saying my wife is. But this COVID-19 stuff has added a level of stress. A wedding for 150 people is going to be a wedding for 20 people. That is disappointing. That causes grief. So there's been grief processing in the midst of stress because there's all of the details still. I've been making signs so that people can find the locations out on a, uh, a country property south of Oregon City, the Portland area. A uh, beautiful rural setting with lots of trees and a small forest, but it's right on a curve on a high-speed road. People will miss it if they drive by. We, we've driven by and had to go back uh, more than once. So we'll get through it, and uh, I'll be giving you a message in 10 days or so that's one that's a, 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 lot, a lot easier, a lot less stress. But back to Rachel and her fiancé, Jacob. Jacob completed his seven years, and now we're in verse 21 of Genesis 29. So, love at first sight, love still after seven years. It hasn't faded. 
And now what comes around goes around. Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you've done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban says, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. <laughs> so it's dark. He goes into the tent and expects that he is lying next to Rachel. And they consummate their relationship, presumably, and now he is legally married to the woman he wakes up next to who is not Rachel. She's Leah, the older sister who has lovely eyes. Yeah, <laughs> well, and she's the older one. And Jacob is cheated and he is outraged. For the first time, maybe he has a hint of how his brother Esau felt when Jacob cheated and stole his blessing and his birthright. Jacob, you deserved this. This is exactly the kind of justice that comes to those who do what you did to your brother. Ha! And Laban has got to be pleased because he knows, number one, Leah's had no suitors. Now she's married. Number two, Leah is married before Rachel. And that's okay. That's a good thing. But Laban says, Complete this week of this one, and we will give you the other also, in returning for me for another seven years. Complete the week of this one. And what is a week? Well, we talked about that before. She's going to then come into the season of fertility, and he is to have a son by Leah. Completing the week, completing that cycle. Okay, so... As soon as I know you have a son by my daughter Leah, I have a grandson, <laughs> and another seven years, by the way, then you can also have Rachel. <sighs> What's he going to do? Verse 28, Jacob did so and completed her week, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. So a week of years and a, and a, and verse 29. Here's this other detail. Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So we have, uh, remember Leah has her maid Milka, or Zilpah rather, verse 24. So Zilpah and now Bilhah in verse 29. So Jacob went in to Rachel also and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So here's God who, who allowed Rebekah to trick her husband Isaac and help her son Jacob steal Esau's blessing and birthright. God allowed that and God honored Isaac's blessing saying, okay, the patriarchs of the Israel are now going to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But God is participating in this. At least that's how the storyteller wants us to understand it. God says, okay, Leah, you're going to have kids, lots of them, Rachel. Not so much. Now, Leah, being older, would probably be less likely to have lots of children. Again, we don't know how old they are, but Rachel was not And again, it's always the woman's fault. In this case, though, if Jacob has children by Leah, well, it does suggest that it would be Rachel, not Jacob. Leah conceived, bore him a son, and named him Reuben. So Reuben, the oldest of what will become the 12 sons of Jacob. And one of the 12 sons tribes of Israel. But again, I'm foreshadowing. Leah conceived again, verse 33. 
bore him a son because the Lord has heard me that I am hated. He has given me a son also. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son. This time my husband will be joined to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. So now we have Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. The first three. She conceived again and bore a son and named him Judah, from which we get the tribe of Judah and the modern Jews, the descendants of Jacob, still alive today, 3,800 years later. Leah, four kids. Wow. Jacob hates her, or at least that's what she believes. Doesn't stop him from having kids by her. How does Rachel feel about that? Again, we can't take our modern versions of what marriages look like and place it on their society. They needed to have lots of children for their race to survive, for God's promise for them to become a multitude. You can't have a multitude with just a couple of kids. You get 12 sons and I don't know how many daughters, and you're going to be a multitude real quick. My grandparents had... Uh, five daughters that all married and had kids. None of the sons did. None of them lived uh, to have children. But of the five daughters, there were then 16, 18 grandkids and uh, 32, I think, great grandkids. So, and, and my parents have, I don't know, 10 grandkids, something like that. Or I don't, and then I don't know how many great grandkids they have now, but wow, yeah. I have three grandkids. Life is good. And for Leah, life was great. A husband that hated her so what? She has four boys. And we don't know how many daughters yet.